At the end of the 19th century, the Russian Empire was vast, poor, and largely agricultural. Per capita income was about 1,500 modern dollars, and the average peasant may do with much less than that, suggesting poverty comparable to the more desperate parts of Africa today. The average Englishman earned 4.6 times more than the average Russian in 1890. Romanov Russia was overwhelmingly rural. Only 13.4% of the empire was urban as late as 1897. This nation of 125 million souls had only two cities with more than 200,000 inhabitants in 1890, St. Petersburg with one million and Moscow with 800,000. And these were largely imperial cities, although Moscow had become the center of Russia's nascent textile industry. Gradually, this backward giant was beginning to industrialize and urbanize. Russian weakness during the Crimean War taught the Tsar that rural societies have difficulty competing militarily with industrial powerhouses like England and France. In 1861, Alexander II liberated the serfs. This meant that peasants were, in principle, free to move to cities, although in practice their former masters still demanded significant payment in exchange for allowing their escape. In the 1880s and 1890s, Sergei Witt tried to thrust Russia into the Industrial Age. Under Witt and Tsar Nicholas II, Russia built railways even across the Siberian vastness. Tariffs protected infant industries. Foreign financing flowed into the empire, and cities started to grow. Kiev and Odessa both reached a half a million inhabitants in 1910. These cities were built up by local magnates, like the Brodskys, who were sugar barons like New York City's Havemeyers. Ekaterinoslav, now Dnipropetrovsk, became a Russian Pittsburgh, combining coal brought by rail from Donetsk and iron mined nearby Krivoy Rog. Ekaterinoslav, whose name honors Catherine the Great, proved an early model for the Russian industrial city, a formerly remote place with access to natural resources that became connected to the wider world by railroads. As the early anti-modernization czars like Nicholas I were well aware, cities posed risks to autocrats, and revolutions broke out in Odessa and St. Petersburg in 1905. Industrial Łódź in Romanov-controlled Poland rebelled as well. Some farmers also rose up, but a general strike in the capital is far more threatening than any rural contretemps. The Romanovs survived that round of uprisings through a combination of appeasement and repression. But Nicholas II lost his throne and his life when St. Petersburg rebelled not once but twice in 1917. World War I had left the Tsars without enough loyal troops to dominate the organized urban workers. The revolution succeeded, just like most successful revolutions, because the troops had lost their loyalty to the Tsar and were unwilling to fire on the unhappy urbanites. The chaos of the Russian Revolution shriveled Russia's great cities and shrank per capita incomes to below 1,000 modern dollars by 1921. The population of St. Petersburg shrank from over 2 million to under 800,000. Moscow's population dropped from 1.8 million to just over 1 million. The new Bolshevik masters of Russia had to rebuild the economy. Lenin's new economic policy was a profoundly mixed model. More freedom for farmers to sell their surplus grain, plus state-owned heavy industry and a small entrepreneurial urban class of NEP men. Russia's incomes were covered to pre-war levels and the cities came back as well. Since Moscow was now the capital, its imperial status turned it into Russia's megacity, with a population that exceeded four million by 1939. When Lenin died and Stalin pushed his way to power, this new red czar wanted his nation's industrial might to rival the Western powers. Starting in 1928, he instituted a series of five-year plans that would drive Russian manufacturing into the 20th century. These five-year plans meant huge factories and cities that were built to enable mass production. Stalin didn't mind starving millions, and he certainly didn't care about urban quality of life or perhaps life more generally. Many of the industrial cities were in the east to take advantage of mineral deposits and coursing waterways. During World War II, even more production facilities were moved toward Siberia to avoid the threat of Hitler's Luftwaffe. In some cases, Stalin's industrialization expanded existing population centers. Ekaterinburg had been founded in 1723 on the border of Europe and Asia. Its name honored the wife of Peter the Great, and it was where the last Tsar and his family were executed. In 1933, it became the home of Euromash, the Ural heavy machine building plant, which made blast furnaces, rolling mills, and cranes for mining cities even further to the east. It also built military materiel, including the famously durable T-34 tanks. Further east, cities like Novosibirsk, the Chicago of Siberia, and Krasnoyarsk expanded enormously during the 1930s. 
Novosibirsk had only been founded in 1893, but it was a natural transportation hub since it sat next to the bridge over the mighty river Ob. Krasnoyarsk is about 450 miles further to the east, and it became a center of the Gulag system, where millions were forced to work in Stalin's factories and mines. In 1956, Krasnoyarsk's industrial advantage was increased by the opening of an awesome hydroelectric dam. Stalin's industrialization created a very special type of city, the Gulag City, population clusters around factories that were developed by and for penal labor. Norilsk may be the most extreme of Stalin's industrial towns. It is the world's northernmost city with over 100,000 inhabitants, and it did not even exist before World War I. Norilsk's great advantage lay underground, in vast Siberian mines that contain enormous amounts of nickel, copper, cobalt, and palladium. A railway was built to connect the city with the nearby port of Dudinka, and from there the minerals could be shipped by sea to Murmansk or up the river Yense to Krasnoyarsk. Gulag labor worked Norilsk's mines under often horrific conditions. More than 15,000 workers died from cold and starvation. In 1953, after Stalin's death, Norilsk rose up in nonviolent protest. Not much came of that. The Gulag system became slightly more humane under Khrushchev, but these eastern industrial cities continued producing metal and machines and misery throughout the Soviet era. In the United States, Rust Belt cities like Cleveland and Detroit suffer because their industries have shrunk or relocated. The very success of those industries had crowded out other local entrepreneurship, and their locations are far from the sunnier climates that most Americans prefer. The problems facing Norilsk and Krasnoyarsk would seem to be far worse. There never was any entrepreneurship in Norilsk, and the climate is awful. The air is terribly polluted. After 1991, Russian mobility increased, and people and firms were largely free to move. Moscow alone restricted immigration, at least nominally. This migration offers the possibility of eventually correcting any extreme geographic imbalances created by Soviet industrialization. Yet Norilsk's population remains at 170,000. Workers stay because the mines offer high wages, wages that are apparently worth losing years of life for. Novosibirsk and Krasnoyarsk have continued to grow. Russia remains highly dependent on natural resources, and many of those resources are in Siberia. It is hard not to think that eventually these cities will see the same shrinkage experienced in the American Rust Belt. If Russia becomes richer and its economy shifts away from natural resources, then Russians will presumably also move to warmer, more humane, consumer cities. Yet for now, Stalin's Siberian industrial cities remain, monuments to a Russia that cared more for industrial success than for human life and happiness.